What again did you win? I've forgotten. <laughs> I just know he won something. Well, I won the Brunel International African Prize for Poetry for Color and 17. International, that sounds big. Massive, baby. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> really big, man. So, how, how, I want to know what um, success tastes like. Is it a strawberry or mango? I don't know. You, you, you've, you've had your failures. We all have um, our failures. We know what failure tastes like. A bland pineapple. So what does success taste like? Does <laughs> failure taste like a bland pineapple? <laughs> I'm just hearing that for the first time. <laughs> well, I don't really know what success tastes like because it's just been two days. I'm still thinking about what the whole thing is all about. I guess um, I never expected it to make it this far. So, so for now, I can't really tell you what success tastes like. Okay, let's do a rewind to your childhood. Um, how was your childhood like, and how has it gotten to shape you to who you are right now? Like, let's do a fast rewind to how many years ago? Twenty. Uh, Twenty years ago, where was I? I think I was just leaving primary school or the about. So you want me to talk about how my childhood looks like? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, don't sound poetic though. Just okay. I'll try not to sound poetic. <laughs> I don't know how to sound poetic anyway. Um, I, I was born in Lagos. I grew up in Lagos, Kaduna, Port Harcourt, then finally in Benin. It's um, my dad was a civil servant, so. We, we had to move a lot. My childhood was not really, really rosy. There were challenges. I lost my dad quite early. When I was, I think, about six, seven. I lost my mom when I was 13. So I really had to survive. And if there's anything my childhood taught me is that sometimes when you're down, it's not like you're out. It's just um, a relaxation spot for you to go back up and survival is something that we all can do. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that sad part. Um, it's, it's I know normal. you yeah it is normal. Um, let's talk about your discovery. When did you did you just wake up one day and say yeah I'm a poet, I'm very sure I'm a poet. Okay. I, I think I read it somewhere once that every poet is a product of heartbreak but unfortunately mine is not the case. I started writing about three, three and a half years back. Um, I, I was going through some some tough times and I discovered poetry and since then it has been this this thing that holds me together and so I find poetry it's a very great tool in my survival. So that, that the fact I'm here boils down to that fact. Okay, I want to know the challenges you faced as a poet living in Nigeria. I mean, I know the frustration gets to us all, businessmen, politicians, teachers, students. So I want to know what the frustration is like for poets. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think each poet has their own general struggle, their own, general, their own journey. Yeah. Um, for me, first of all, is the fact that there are certain books that you want to read that you don't get them yet. They're not available. You have to um, buy them online and sometimes they don't accept our cards and stuff like that. And so you find yourself getting books just because a friend of yours traveled out of the country or just because someone was magnanimous enough to send you some books. Like for example, um, Oshen Vyong is the debut collection of poetry. I had to wait for almost a year to hold the book between my hands, so it's um, a struggle. And there's also the fact that there are very few places where um, you can read your works, and then you have, naturally, the government does not support anything, so <laughs> art, art on its own, it's, a, a, it, it's a, a sector, I'd call it that, where it's, it's greatly been underfunded by the government, so and add that to the normal struggle in Nigerian face, you find out that it's very um, difficult to be a creative in this country. Um, abroad you have fellowships, you have writers retreats, you have... There are lots of um, resources 
in place for you to succeed if you are um, a creative, say you're a poet. But in Nigeria, you, um, it's a very, very personal journey. So it's one of the challenges, but well, just like um, every Nigerian, there are always ways to, yeah, to, wait, through to wait through the storm. Yeah. I know that um, there, are, there are poets, there are people you see and you'll be like, ah, I've not started, I'm still learning. Who are those people? Can you, I don't know if there are, because I know that many people like, I asked on Facebook if there are people who have questions for you. People are saying, how do you do this? How do you do it? We look up to you. You're a king, you're this, you're this. So I want to know, are there people you look at and you'll be like, uh-uh, I've not started? Well, um, I think life generally is, um, I'll not call it a race, but it's um, a journey where you have people at the midpoint, people at the end point, people at the starting point. Um, for me, I have poets I look up to. There's um, Dambuzo Marachera. He's a late poet from Zimbabwe. I like the fact that out of chaos, he could produce something so beautiful. Um, in Nigeria, yeah, of course, we all know Olesho Inga and um, Nero Kiwale, Dami Ajayi. There's Benga Adeshino, who's a very, very beautiful poet. Um, there's Swedi Veshima. Um, I like the poetry of Sai Jones, Carl Phillips, and Oshin Viong, who's um, a very big influence in my poetry. And there's also Wasan Shiri. I think there are lots of wonderful poets out there that if I start naming them, we might spend one hour just doing that. So let me just cut it short. But there are very wonderful poets out there who I look up to. And for me, despite the fact that I won a prize, it's just three, three and a half years I started writing. So I still have a very long journey ahead of me. And it's the, the, the main thing for me is that it's beautiful to just be in this space where you have so many beautiful minds around you. You read so many beautiful minds and it helped me grow, so... Okay. Um, should, we, should we talk about the edge this prize has given you in the industry, the poetry in all the literature industry? Should we talk about that? Uh, um, I, I think um, one thing I'm surprised about is the uh, massive publicity that came with the prize. Like... <laughs> My younger brother called me on Naira land, they were arguing about my tribe, which for me was surprising. I think if it had, it had given me any edge, is the fact that my work is widely read by people who don't even know me. And then there's also this um, fear that comes with it. Like for me, I like my work to speak more than me. You understand? It's like. And that's, that's the way I, I, I engage any text. When I'm reading a work, I want that work to speak to me rather than the poet or the person behind the work. So that there's this fear in my heart that I'm going to overshadow my work. So there's a lot of edges. I, I think the prize will come with a lot of opportunities and all that. But for now, I'm, I'm taking things one step at a time and like, like we've always said, it's a journey, so I'm just hoping and it ends in a good place. Considering the fact that most of your works, your poetry works, and like you said the other day on, on your post that the, the poems you um, um, submitted, you, you wrote them on Facebook, yeah? Yeah, that's okay. true. Um, how about you, we wake up one morning and there's no Facebook? How do you think? <laughs> Would that be a massive blow to you, considering the fact that you started here and maybe to gather your fans back somewhere else that's not Facebook? How about you think about that? I know it's, it's, it's an awkward stuff, but... <laughs> well, um, one thing about the works we, we put out there is the fact that we are putting out these works, but we are not to detect how far they would go. You understand? Um, when I write on Facebook, I also have a backup. I write on um, MS Word. I store my my um, poems there. So if Facebook is good tomorrow, 
I would have um, a collection of my work somewhere that I can still fall back to. Okay, that's a good one. Um, you've written and you've talked about your war, your battle with um, bipolar and, and all that is attached to the illness. I want to know how how you've you've been able to. Um, I'm trying not to sound um, mm, somehow. You should, be, you should be free. No, I know, I know, right? But then I just want to be a bit sound nice, <laughs> nice in the sense of being nice. I don't know um, how how has being bipolar helped you, and how has it drawn you back from your dream. <laughs> I'll start answering a question with um, this statement. I think men mental health awareness in Nigeria is very, very low. Although we have people that are trying to um, raise awareness, but it's still low. And so you have people that are mentally ill, struggling, and thinking there's something wrong with them when there's a, a means of managing that. I, I don't think being bipolar has helped me in any way. Um, before I was on medication, I had massive mood swings. So this is where I could be high for days, a week, two weeks, and it was not really, really funny. I, I feared the highness than the depression part of it. So um, it, it's, it has been a challenge. Yes, I've written about it, but um, it's still a challenge, it's still something I face. Like this morning, I had to take drugs to function, to be um, a bit okay. Which, um, in a way, it's, well, I'd say it's okay. But being bipolar has um, really, really affected me. I had to drop out of school twice because I, I could not cope with the illness. I was not diagnosed by then, so I, I thought what I felt at that then was very wrong thing and um, there was no way I could keep up with things. So it has, it has really, really drawn me back. Like for example, there are certain decisions I want to take now. You know, when you, um, you um, feel invincible, you feel you can do anything, you take decisions rashly and in a hurry. So um, one of the disadvantages of being bipolar is that these days I tend to be slow when taking decisions because I, I want to be sure um, I'm the one taking it and not the illness. So there are, there are different um, challenges that come with being bipolar. But um, like any doctor will tell you, the main thing is to stay on medication. Um, other people have different means of fighting the illness. But I think and so far with what I've been through, the best way is to just to be on medication. And so um, it's allow you to live your life normally. Um, let's go to Facebook and know what's happening there. Um, John Manuel's Enekele, I'm sorry if I didn't get the pronunciation well. He said, you are a poet with a great potential. Can you give aspiring poets some of your drive? Um, I, I don't know about aspiring poets. I, I feel the moment you pick up a pen and write a poem, you've become a poet, you've started a journey. What remains is for you to keep honing your craft. I once attended a workshop with Jumoke Verissimo, um, a very brilliant poet, in which she, she, she taught us that metaphors can be created from anything. And that's what I try to do. I try creating metaphors from the most simple things around me. Take for instance, the grasses, air. I'm in love with water. And I just feel that the most important thing for any poet is to keep honing his or her craft, is to keep improving, keep reading. And that's my advice because I strongly believe that there's um, no writer without a reader. You have to be a reader for you to write. So I believe in order for you to be good, you have to read a lot. Read a lot of poems, read a lot of books and at the end of the day, you find yourself excelling. Okay. Um, talking about 
creating metaphors from anything. How about you do one for us? Like maybe the glasses or the carpet or the microphone or your cap? I don't know. <laughs> well, um, quickly, I can say my cap is a canopy covering dreams and broken dreams and cities full of fire. That was, that was, that was, that was lit. This is my favorite word or phrase. Joe Aito, who is a well-known writer in the, that we all know, um, asked two questions. <laughs> Do you see yourself ever writing prose? That's the first question. The second question goes like this. Are you interested in collaborations with short story writers and script writers? Would you consider this? Oh, uh, um, for the first question, I do write prose and I write non-fiction, but I think for now I'm the only person that's seen them. I'm not that comfortable um, sharing them yet, but I guess maybe sometime in the future I will. Then for collaborating with short story writers and script writers, I really don't know. I think I'm more comfortable as a poet and that's what I'm doing for now. So maybe in the future we would see what opportunities will come our way and we would react based on that. All right, Olo asks, what do you think is responsible for your dazzling poems? <laughs> well, um, I don't know, I, I still think that a writer writes and then it's like a child giving back to a child. You don't know how far the child will go, whether he will excel or fail. So as a writer, I, I try to write my truth, to own my truth and write it. And um, so after writing, it's left for the reader to think whether it's dazzling or not. So um, I think I'm a product of many books. I read a lot of poems. I read a lot of books. I study life. I study people. I study places. Um, Victoria Shima, she's my friend from Germany, she asks, um, why did you choose poetry of all professions? Well, um, um, growing up, I had this very rough, like I earlier said, this rough stage of my life and poetry was one way to name that chaos, poetry was one way to understand what was going on in my body and also outside of my body. So it's something I started and I never knew I would be taking it this serious, but it's that it happened and I'm glad it did. Um, we are done with um, the Facebook um, questions and I, I don't know if you were the one sitting here and I was the one sitting here, is there any question you would have loved to ask yourself? No, <laughs> <laughs> no question. <laughs> okay, um, quick question, are you in a relationship? Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, another quick question. Where do you see yourself in five years? Well, um, five years is a very, very huge time from now. The big, the big time. I don't know. But in five years' time, I, I think I should um, probably be settled in what I'll be doing in life. Whatever that is for now, I'm not even sure. So, but in five years, I should probably be teaching somewhere. That's all. Yeah. What's your favorite color? Black. Why? Because, because life is not fair. <laughs> no, not really because life is not fair. Because it's dark, you can hide things in the dark. Okay. Um, favorite meal? Mm. To be true, true, go do more. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite beer? Uh, I'm in Enugu, so I have to represent the East now, you know, hero. I yeah, want hero, no time. Yeah, yes, um, hero. Your turn off? <laughs> Uh, fake people. Turn on. Real people. Real people. Crazy uh. people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think that will be all for now. Unless he has something to tell his fans. I mean, fame is a beautiful thing. Never allow the dark side of life to weigh you down. Whatever you're passing through, there's um, always a window waiting to be opened. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>